If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. Uh, and uh, as always, I covet your prayers. I need that. Uh, I need to uh, uh, have the Lord's people praying for me, and certainly you do too. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, in verse 13, the Bible says, uh, Colossians 2.13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting, blotting out all the handwritings of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us, and took, and took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And it's full of principalities and powers. He, excuse me, having spoiled principalities and powers, he had made shoe of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Let, there, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Amen. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and the worshiping and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he have not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. And not holding the head from all the body by joints and bands, having, nourish, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increase of the increase of God. Wherefore ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are to, peri or which are to perish with the using after commandments and doctrines of men what things have need a sh what things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh and if you be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for another day. God, we pray that you would bless your word this morning, that you would set all idle thoughts aside, Lord, that we might focus in on you. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would just make me a mouthpiece for unto yourself, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, I'm going to read, uh, look back at this, but I want you to see, first of all, if you'll notice, I kind of uh, crossed over two chapters, and the reason I did that, and we were just talking about the King James Bible before we began, uh, all the verses and the chapters were just cut cuts of thought that uh, the translators thought would be a good way to help us study. They were not in the original text. They were just like a letter. If I wrote a letter to Donna, it would be whole and intact. I would not number the sentences, and I would not, I would not break them down that way. So when you read the text, sometimes the ideas when you finish are complete, and sometimes they're not. And sometimes you need to read a little bit further back or a little bit forward to get the full thought. And so that's kind of what we've looked at this morning, and we're going to be talking about setting our affections, putting them in the right place, uh, and, I, and the responsibility that we have to do so. Now, we, uh, a lot of times, as Sovereign Grace Baptist people, we don't want to take on the ownership of anything. 
Now, when you get to that point, you're down to being primitive Baptist, and whatever will be, will be, case sirrah, sirrah, and there's no personal responsibility, whatever. But I want you to see, and we'll get there in a minute, that Paul very clear, clearly tells the church at Coloss, you said, you died, you placed it, it's your responsibility. And we don't necessarily like that in the modern day, but it is what the scriptures teach. Now, going back to verse 13, the Bible says, and you. Now, he was addressing saved people, and as in Brother Junior's uh, class this morning, I took note of this. Uh, all we can do is take people by their testimony, but it doesn't mean they're saved. See, that, that, that boy at the wedding feast, right up to the last day, I'm assuming he thought he was okay. Mm -hmm. And then and then the king come by and says, you're not fit. Get out of here. And you know, there, there'll be a lot more than we know. And listen, I'm not just talking about heretics. I mean our kind of people. A lot more than you know that will get that message. That, that will hear, depart from me, you work of iniquity. So as Paul is writing to the church at Colossus, he is making this assumption that he's addressing saved folks. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, he makes two notes about us as believers there. First of all, we were dead in our sin. We were dead where we were at. Our trespasses had killed us already. There was no hope whatever approaching the throne of grace. There was nothing that we as God and we as people could do. We were dead. Now, another thing against us, he says, you were uncircumcised. Now, if I understand what I think is correct about the church of Colossa, it was a, a Greek people. Uh, and if you know anything about the Greeks, they were filthy, sensual, ungodly people. About, about the worst, it's kind of, you know, where uh, the Olympics come from in that same general area and, and the nakedness and the filth of that place. Uh, he says, you wasn't even a Jew. And you know what? We weren't either. Right. Uh, there's not a one of us that can claim jewelry in, in this building this morning. So we, like the Colossians, were very much in this same boat. And in that same boat, he says, and have quickened or made us alive together with him. Now, isn't that amazing that he rose up himself and he quickened us with that wonderful victory over death? He made us alive. Now, the problem this morning when making a decision for Christ is dead people can't think. They cannot make a decision because they're dead and there's no benefit for them whatsoever. And so we find that these individuals were saved Greek people and he reminds them of that. Now, notice what it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Now, he's talking about them not being Jewish. And he and when the Lord died and gave his, and gave his life's blood for me and you and all his uh, that ever were, he blotted out the law. Now, listen, we live in a day and age today, and I've seen it mushroom in, my, in the last 30 years where the old Jewish law is being embraced again. Uh, you know what? Uh, these people that call themselves Messianic Jews, they are not. Right. Uh, they are not Jews, and sometimes I even wonder if they're Christian. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get back into that mess, I think something's wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they want everything but the sacrifice, what I will bet is one day they'll include the sacrifice too. It's just going to take a little bit of time. And, and, and so we find then that Paul reminds the Colossian believers, listen, that's over with. That's been blotted out by my blood. That's done. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, can you imagine embracing something that you know already is against you? Now, you think about, and there's not a person in this room that don't have somebody that don't like it. And I probably have more than most. 
And can you imagine knowing full well they didn't like you and you coming up and giving them a big hug? Mm. Now that's what the law is about. It's against us. It describes how vile and wicked and ungodly that we really are and we're going to come up and give it a big group hug. He said, you don't have to do that. Why would we do that? Why, why would we embrace something we never could have done to start with? It, it, it doesn't make sense. And, and, and so we find then, he reminds these Greek believers, listen, that's behind you. Also, he describes this, which was contrary to us. How could you embrace something that's against you? That, that's what they were saying. It was contrary to everything that you are. And took it out of the way. I love that. Took it out of the way by the, by the cross. Now, listen. Right here, standing right here. Right. What, what prevents me from getting to Sister Abigail is this pew. It's an oak pew. It's heavy. It's bolted to the ground. That is a, you know, that's what prevented us getting unto God, Jehovah, is the law. You know what the Bible says? It's a schoolmaster. It's a teacher, right? Uh, we all had teachers we liked and disliked going up, right? And I have one I could not stand. And, you know, what's funny about it was the only year I ever did perfect attendance. I'm like, I, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> and uh, she still lives here in the county. I won't say who she was. <coughs> But uh, she was a bad schoolmaster. Uh, and you know what? All the law has done for you is say you're a stinking, rotten sinner. So why would we possibly ever embrace that again? And you know what? They had the, the same problem with the churches of Galatia. They were doing the exact same thing. It, it is just in man's nature to want to work for your salvation. That's part of mankind's depravity. Took it away. Took that pew out of the way. I get right, right to nailing it to the cross. The law is over with. And having spoiled the principalities and powers. If you remember, in another church that he said, overcoming the, prince and prince, the princes and principalities of this present evil world. All that's behind him. He's overcome the law. He's overcome Satan. He, it's all beneath his feet. Right. That's the Christ you have to right. worship if you're going to worship Christ. Right. Any, anything less, you're not, you may be worshiping something, but it is not the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blotting out the handwriting of or, uh, 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 excuse me, and having spoiled principalities, verse 15, and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them. The law settled, the law defeated. He became out of victory. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. And apparently this was going on. Now, I don't know about y'all. I like pork. I love bacon. Now, do I want to reject that because I'm a Christian? No, I don't have to. Praise be to God, right? <laughs> because the law is gone. It's no longer there. And uh, I, don't, I think the Jew, Jewish diet is healthy. If you just look at it in the health contents, but it's not something that we have to do. You know what diet you have to be concerned is that <coughs> that's the only diet you need. Uh, and, 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 and get this one and get in it and stay in it. Right? And, and, and so we find then getting this victory over the law and, and, and the dietary law and all that goes with the law, let, let, uh, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. Now, these Messianic Jews out there today, they'll meet on the Jewish Sabbath and they'll, they'll keep their feast of the tabernacle and all that stuff that goes with it. Then they call themselves Christians. Then why are you acting like a Jew? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Not real popular teaching today because, listen, like I said, that's mushrooming just like the bomb of Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. 
but it is what it is. It, it, it does not it does not adhere to New Testament teaching at all. And, and so he says, why would you pick that up again? Then he gives them the purpose of it from the beginning, which are a shadow of things to come. Right. The body, the body is of Christ. Yeah. So all that jewelry was uh, the one purpose was it to say you are a sinner and Christ is the, is the answer. That that was the whole Old Testament. It, it was done with that one thing. You are a sinner. The Messiah is the answer. That that was the whole thing. And, and I love studying the Old Testament, like preaching from the Old Testament. But listen, that's the sum of the matter. Was to say you are a sinner and in desperate need of help. And that was the, that was the sum of the whole matter. Verse eighteen: Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Now, again, he's writing to believers, right? And he says, "Let no man beguile you. Don't don't be tricked about this." Let nobody, let no man deceive you to be, you know, where did we go at the one that everybody remembers? The serpent beyond Eve. Right? And you know what? There's people out there. And listen, it's not just those people in their white shirts and, and, and black breeches on the bicycles. There's people that call themselves Baptists out there to beguile you. Right. They're, they're, they're out there to deceive. They're out there to make you lose track. They're out there to cause problems. Let no man beguile you. And again, if he's warning them to not, not be beguiled, apparently it can happen. Just because you're sovereign grace don't mean you can't be beguiled, apparently, from this text. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility. Now, I want you to see, apparently, <laughs> rewards in heaven was being challenged at this church. And you know what? There are rewards in heaven. But listen, you ain't going to get one sitting on that pew. You're not going to get one just existing as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And apparently they were beguiled and said, hey, that ain't even true. That's foolishness. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to Paul. He's, he, he's, he's gone. Don't you listen to that. And so we find that there is rewards out there. There are things that we can do of a a voluntary humility. Now you think about all the years you've been serving the Lord, and have you ever had one of those preachers that just thought they was just a cut above? I'm just being honest. You know, you know what that is? They're not doing any voluntary humility at all. You know what? It's good to know about that book. That, that, that's all, in fact, that's a responsibility of the Lord's churches and particularly preaching men. But man, I've seen them puffed up. What was it in the little epistle of Jude? He, uh, he said, you are puffed up. And I think if I remember correctly, he compared them to Jannies and Jambres in the wilderness. See, we need uh, preacher boys, we need to have some humility about us, and we need to present the gospel with a natural humility. Well, let me take that back, strike that from the record, because you know what? There's no such thing as a natural humility. Now, I'm not going to say any names again, but there was a woman that worked at the high school uh, that told me that I was not college material. Uh, she basically said, and there's nothing wrong with this, but she basically said, you need to be working the line in a factory. And, you know, I'm like, well, that's what she's saying. But, you know, because I don't possess humility or don't always possess humility, 
When I got my invitation that said I was graduating with honors from the University of Tennessee at Martin, I wanted to send him one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what's humility in that? You know what's the real humility in that? Four years later, I took care of her husband while he was dying. Mm -hmm. And she found out what kind of nurse I was. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Voluntary humility. If we don't have that, nursing won't be effective, teaching will be ineffective, preaching will be ineffective because people are going to take you as snooty. And, and, and so we find then that Paul, as he's writing to the church at Colossae, he says, listen, there's, there is blessings in a voluntary humility, not a humility that is required. And that, that was the big difference to these two, two groups of people, what they were being taught. Endure, intruding unto things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up, there's our word again, up by his fleshly mind. What was, punch, what was puffing him up? <laughs> His fleshly mind. I said, who can I humiliate? Brother Kenny, you're going to go to the spot in a couple weeks anyway. What's the normal uh, potassium level for a human? Something 0.5 to something 0.5. It was, it was between 1 and 6. Well, that's true, but if you get too high either way, you only got 1 point, it's 3.5 3. 3. to 4.5. <laughs> and if you get 4.8, you die. And if you get below two, you die. Now, you knew the point fives, but what if you looked at one and didn't? There's a lot of point fives between one and nine. <laughs> right? Eighteen, right? <laughs> and should I hold that up? I mean, man, I know the normal potassium level and you don't. <laughs> right? There's no humility in that, is there? None whatsoever. But if he'd give me his line and say, man, Larry, I've been feeling so bad. And I look at it, and again, it don't take much to get off on the passive. If you get to six, you're dead. <laughs> but if it was five, and I said, man, it looks like a kidney is really messing up. You need to go see a doctor. That's humility. You see what I'm saying? And I'm afraid that sovereign grace people are always on the prideful side. Man, I believe the five points. I even believe six. Where, where is where's the humility and love in that? Right? And, and so we see then as the Lord's people what he would rather us be, what he would rather us do, is just to be humble. Don't be like this man. Verse 19, and not holding the head from which all the bodies by joints and bands have nourishment ministered, knit together, increaseth, uh, increases which, which with the increase of God. So you go by the humility route, you go by, hey, listen, I'll wash your feet. Listen, I'll paint the walls to the building, I'll vacuum the carpet. Whatever you need, I'll do. And what's that do? It worships the head. And listen, it's not the Pope. The head is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? When, when there's something in the church to do and you're too good for it, you might as well leave. Amen. Right? Amen. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that Colossus was given a clear understanding of how it ought to be done. Verse 20, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, he says, if, you're, if you are dead in Christ, if you are saved, if you are born again, and again, we'll go back to our dead example because that's the key of so much of Paul's teaching. Dead in Christ means everything's about him. If you get moved when you're dead, it's because somebody moves you. Right. If you get dressed when you're dead, it's because somebody dressed you. Now that's supposed to be once we're saved where we operate. What do you want me to wear? 
What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And very few of us in the modern day find ourselves in such a situation, but rather that's where we ought to live all the time. And wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments or the challenges or the elements of this world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Why is the law there? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. So if that's what we're going to hang on to, I'm going to work my way, and I'm going to be exemplary, and I'm going to be the best thing since Billy Graham, listen, you're going to perish in it. Right? Remember that old Catholic woman, best I know? Uh, don't mean it bad, she probably split hell wide open, but man, she got some attention, Mother Teresa, right? You know why she got so much attention? She's pushing herself. Look at how humble. And if you watch her, if you ever seen video of her, she was a very humble lady, or at least that's how she presented. Are you faking it? You know what I fully believe she was. I fully believe she was. You can't let fake humility long. It, 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 will, it will jump out. Uh, your pride will jump out very, very quickly. And, and, and so we find then, they say, don't pick this stuff back up. Paul says, don't you go back to that touch not, taste not. Don't do that. After the commandments and doctrines of men. Now remember, in the very first of our reading, it said the law is dead. And you think about all you know today, uh, including the Messianic Jews, and, and even Seventh-day Adventists, and I don't mind saying that this morning, you know what all they're doing is picking the law back up, and Paul warns the Colossian church very carefully about it. Don't do it. Don't, don't go back to the rudiments of the flesh. Don't go back to what you were before. And really, they weren't even that. Verse 23, which things indeed, uh, which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom or knowledge about the scriptures and will, and will worship, you know, and I'm so good in my will and humility, neglecting the, neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of what? The flesh. Then he says three in the first verse, if. If, any Bible time the Bible says if, you better take note. If ye then be risen with Christ. Are you this morning? Are you risen from Christ? You've been taken from dead, death to life? No more important question I can ask anybody this morning is do you know Christ? Because, dear friend, if you don't, you're on your way to a devil's hell. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Listen, how do we seek the upper place? How do we seek the abode of God? How do we seek the things of the third heaven? You seek them with this right here. Listen, if this month book is boring to you, if you have no interest in these things, if you don't have an inbuilt desire to look deeper into the Word of God, Listen, dear friend, this morning, make your calling and election short because that should be an inbuilt built desire for a child of God. Amen. You know what, what is one of the telltale signs a baby is sick? My, my wife has been midwifing for almost as long as probably over, over 25 years. The first thing, if a baby doesn't take suck, there's a problem. There's something going on. Because mm -hmm. there's an inbuilt desire for that baby to nurse. And if it doesn't nurse, start looking for problems. And you know what? If you to the Word of God, start looking for problems. Now, that's easy to go, you know what? Donna's not reading her Bible enough. Uh, uh, Jared, I, I haven't seen anything on Facebook about Scripture for him in a week. Something's going on. 
But what about you? Yeah. What about an introspection? And you know, it's, it's wonderful to study the Word of God. But do you have a drive for it? Do you look for things? Do you, you know what? The, the very text of this scripture, I woke up at 1.30 this morning, and that was on, on my mind, and I turned my Bible to it, and I marked her down because I knew, you ever been woke up with a, with a, a scripture or a message on your mind? If you've always had it, you will be. And you know what? When it does, get on it. Get on it and preach it just like he gives it to you. And so he's very, very uh, specific with the Colossian church about the if. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection. Now, setting indicates personal control. If I wanted to sit down somewhere, I could walk into anywhere in this building and very much of myself sit down. Now, me and Donna was talking about this, and I didn't know the oven was going to catch on fire downstairs. And my mother-in-law and I talked about it on the phone the other day, how we hate the new stoves. Now, uh, most of you can remember here, I don't know some of you, y'all remember when it's so simple, you just dial a number and the stove would do that and usually there was no problem whatsoever. And, and, and notice how, and I, when we bought this last stove, we bought it over here, and I said, I just want one with knobs on it that I can turn to a temperature and that's where to be. But we don't make them like that anymore. No, that's right. Uh, and I said, well, I want dials. Because, you know, you have to push them. Well, we can give you dials, but they're still controlled by a computer. Oh, well, I guess I'm going to get a new stove. And you know why I don't like that stove and Donna's don't like that stove? It's because we can't set it. We need to set our life. We need to set our testimony. We need to set what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And it's your responsibility. Don't you blame the Godhead if you haven't said it right. Yeah. Yeah. Because see, when he says, set your mind, that's a personal responsibility. Isn't it? That, that is something yeah. individually that we, become, we have to take ownership of. Set your affections on things above and not on thing and and not on things on the earth. Now, what do you set your affections on? Because apparently we can set on a lot of things. Now, uh, 34 years ago, Valentine's Day, I mean, I set my affections. And they've been there ever since. Right? Was it a deliberate act that I asked Donna to go out with me? Sure it was. Now, was it a challenge? Sure. A lot of things. Number one, I was real skinny. I wasn't the best looking guy in school. I had hair down here. And uh, she was all bubbly, bubbly, and I was all quiet. I would, that's hard to believe now, but I really was. And but I have set my affections and it impacted my actions. So, despite everything else, I walked up to her and said, Donna, would you like to go to the dance with me? And she said, yeah. And, you know, uh, it calls with joy to be in my heart. I drove that old car to uh, school that day and you couldn't cell phone me. And so I got home, I went quick as you can go on the 49 highway back up to home and said, Mama, I'm going to the Valentine's dance with Donna Page. And she said, well, who's she? <laughs> and the only way I could, I could like, and make my mom okay with it, I said, well, you know that girl that um, uh, Lois McCarty's son married? It's her first cousin, and she was a cool lady. And, uh, and, uh, and I set my affections, and it impacted my actions. Mm -hmm. And when you set your affections on things above, it'll impact your actions. Uh, 
It'll make you preach the gospel. It'll make you pay your time before you eat. It, it'll make you do some crazy things when our affections are appropriately set. Now, very quickly, because I'm not going to finish this. Uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse just verse 13 for time's sake. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto uh, those things which are before. Now, the first thing you need to do, if you want to, if you want to set your affections, you want to put the dial on the right speed. Listen, you forget what you've done before. Now, I'm not a cooker. I don't know how to cook. Uh, I guess I starved to death if I outlived Donna. But I, but you know what? I do know this: that all things don't cook, cook on the same temperature. And, and I've seen Donna make some really good cake. And I've also seen her throw them in the trash. Nobody ever even tastes one crumb of them. And, and, and you know what? Uh, everything has to be done a little bit different. Now, uh, my mother-in-law, I've noticed this, she really cranks the oven up for cornbread. Now, if you crank your oven up to cornbread temperature and put pie in there, you're going to have a mess. So... Uh, I don't care how good that cake looked. What's in front of you? I don't care how good that cornbread tasted. What's in front of you? You know, if you're not real careful as a preacher, you're like, man, I remember that when I preached that message and everybody was on point, it was so great. Who cares? That's behind you, right? That doesn't matter anymore. Set your affection. Set your eye. Listen, we're running a race, and all that matters is what happened next. What's in the past is in the past. And, and so we see as the Lord's people, certainly we need to understand and know that we need to look forward. We need to look, uh, uh, as we're turning the knob, as we're setting our affections, always look forward. Don't look backwards and measure your success that way. Philippians 4, this time drop down to Philippians 4, 18. Philippians 4, excuse me, 8. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. Yeah. Now, after you're looking forward, listen, <laughs> I think it was a Quaker saying, but there's a lot of truth in it. And out of mind is a devil's workshop. What we need to do in idle moments is think of the goodness of God. In idle moments, think on the complete sacrifice of Christ. <clears throat> in idle time, you think of how glorious on the third heaven where the Lord Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. What a beautiful and wonderful sight that must be. Think on things above. Because I want to tell you this. Two things will happen if all you think about is here and now. You'll get prideful or you'll be about ready to kill yourself. One or two is going to happen. You know what? Things are going to get worse before they get better. Amen. That's right. <laughs> you ready to pay four dollars for a gallon of gas? Yeah. Because it's coming. Or do you want to contemplate the glory of God? Right. And, and Jesus standing to wel to welcome Stephen home. Yeah. And that there's there's this difference as daylight and dark in that image. You'll be ready to quit if you think on things down here. So your mindset is one thing. The direction that you're looking at and where your goal is at and not thinking back to misery failures or maybe possible successes, but looking forward to what's yet and still in front of you. Let's play 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians uh, Excuse me. Uh, first Thessalonians. Oh, good thing, isn't it? 
2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead in his appearing and his kingdom. Two separate judgments, two separate arrivals. Preach the word. Be instant already in season and out of season. And, and you know, a lot of times I've thought about that, and especially he's uh, addressing Timothy, a young preacher, that he's saying, you be ready to preach anytime you're ready. But as, as time has gone on, I wonder if it's just, it's just a general command. Are you instant in season and out of season? I mean believers, not just preaching brethren. Um, what's an instant? That's it. You know, at one time, Donna had our children so well trained and some of the boys stood to it and she went, <clears throat> they're like, well, you don't know. Because she trained them. Listen, I'm not even going to say your name. But if I clear my throat, you look at me. And she, they do. And that means you're ready, don't you? What made them ready? What made them look at Donna every time she cleared her throat? Now she'd have allergies and clear her throat. The kids are all... Like, and, and it means how they were trained. They were instant. They were ready. Are you ready? Uh, are you ready to go? Are you ready to meet the Lord? And, and so therein, therein is where we need to be all the time. Verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of receipt, season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears to truth from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. So he commands us to. Uh, forget the, what's behind us, to think on godly things, and to watch. And listen, when you watch, it doesn't necessarily you know. Ever thought about that? You just watch. Now, uh, because of my allergies, Donna went down and did chores, and she put uh, this hamburger in, uh, in a pan there on the stove, and I was just walking by, and I stirred it a little bit. And I thought she'd come back and they got, and I sort of stirred it again. I ended up cooking the whole thing. And the reason I knew I was watching, I didn't want it to burn. I wanted it to be ready. And all I did was watch it. You know what? You don't know when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and neither do I. But you can watch. Amen. You don't know the next person that's going to walk into the building, but you can watch. You don't. You don't know anything, really, but you can watch. And that therein is what we need to be. Are you like the people at class? Are you watching and waiting? Are you running forward and not looking back? Uh, you know, sometimes I use my past as illustration. But sometimes I think, well, maybe I do it too much because I don't want to look back. I want to look forward. Your mistakes will take you down. Look forward. Continue to move. That's what we're commanded to do. This morning I ask you, uh, are you setting up? Are you moving the dials? Are you being specific? You got the temperature where you want it. Is the oven going to burn long enough? What do you set things up as? You know what? Uh, Kimmy, as you're, you're at a unique crossroads in your life, set it right. Amen. You're not going to be me in here. Right, Jared? Set it. Are you. And this is all of you are interested in souls being saved or notoriety. I would think about Billy Graham. And you know, if you really study, he started out right. 
He knew some things. The school that he went to, I wouldn't put my dog in. I wouldn't want to mess Pepper up like that. But he was a saved man. And you know, you know why he went the direction he did? He wanted notoriety. And he's willing to sell out for it. So you had to say, you know, somewhere along the way, old Billy, he either moved his dial or it was never set right to start with. Right? So where's yours at this morning? What, what, what is your desire?